All right, welcome everybody to another edition of the Omaha Bar Association uh, Just the Basics. We're here today um, to hear from Eric Govan and Patrick Stevenson on the um, copyright law that your attorneys at QTech Rock. Um, I have a good authority that QTech Rock is generally where you go when you have copyright issues, um, IP issues. They're one of the top firms to, to do with uh, English property. And there's a lot of things in the news about copyright, so I thought we'd bring in the experts to talk about that. Uh, if you're watching on demand, um, please contact me for receiving credit and take it Thank you. Um, like Dave said, Erica Govan, I am a partner in QTAC Rocks Omaha office, and I primarily practice in intellectual property, trademarks, commercial technology transactions, and copyrights, you know, primarily on the transaction side with some trademark litigation. I'm Patrick Stevenson. I'm a partner at Kutek Rock. I want to thank all you for coming today and thank uh, Dave for having us out. Thank you very much. Uh, my practice focuses generally on trademarks, so this gave me an opportunity to kind of uh, uh, refresh my knowledge on some of the copyright issues I may have been a little shaky on. Also gave me an opportunity to go through my closet and figure out how many of my suits don't fit me, so that was good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, Erica is going to start us off with uh, the basics of copyright law, what it is, what it protects, how to register a work, and why. I'm going to talk a little bit about copyright infringement, the elements of a copyright infringement claim, some things that will get you in trouble, some defenses, and some misconceptions. Then we're going to talk about some copyright cases that you may have seen in the news and some recent AI developments we think are interesting. And if we have time, uh, we'll take some questions. All right. So part one, you know, the basics of copyright law. You know, what is it? How we get there? So uh, a copyright is a legal protection granted to the creator of an original work of authorship. You know, this could be music, literature, you know, computer software code, art, as in a photograph or a painting. And it prevents others, third parties, from using or profiting from a work without permission. Um, one of the common misconceptions is, you know, how you get a copyright. Um, the copyright is automatically created when the work of authorship is created. So I paint a painting, you know, the, the copyright rights attached to that painting, you know, of the minute that I create the painting. Um, and, and it is notable, you know, registration with the Copyright Office, the U.S. Copyright Office, it is a entity of the U.S. federal government, is not required to create the right to a copyright once it's fixed. It is a step that gives you, you know, different rights and remedies. Um, but it is not, you know, a, a magical process in which a copyright is created. The, the triggering event is the creation of the work. Um, with that, you know, the creator of the copyright is not always the owner. You know, there's different types of ownership. Um, one, you know, I create a work. I am a, a painter. I paint it. I own that work. Um, but there, there's other situations. The most common of the three are work for hire, joint ownership, and an implied license. Um, so work for hire is, is what is most commonly encountered. It is where a employee as a part of their regular duties creates something. So I am a software programmer for Google and I am writing software code for Google. Um, that that could be considered a work made for hire, but for you know let let's talk about some some exceptions in the narrowness of the statute. Or two, you know I am an independent contractor and I have a written agreement between you know me independent contractor and the individual hiring me to to create a work. Um, the the work made for hire provision is is very very narrow. Um, most most attorneys think, oh, it's very, very broad, you know, they're an employee, or, oh, I have this, you know, independent contractor agreement that says, hey, you're going to provide services to me, and I'm going to pay you X number of dollars. Um, however, that written agreement must actually contemplate what the work is, 
and it must expressly include, you know, I call it magic language. It must specifically say, hey, this is going to be a work for hire, reference the statute, and it has to be signed by, by the parties to be bound. Um, interesting enough, you know, if you, if you go through and, and read the statute, it is very, very narrow what is considered a work made for hire. Um, the, the statute says it's a work specifically ordered or commissioned for use as a contribution to a collective work as a part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work, as a translation, as a supplementary work, as a compilation, as an instructional text, as a test, as an answer material for a test, or as an atlas. So, so very, very narrow. So if you cannot take what was created and contemplated in that written agreement or within your scope of employment and put it within one of those items, it will not qualify as a work made for hire. Um, so if it's not, okay, what do we do? Um, you need to have an assignment. So an assignment saying, hi, I am the author. I created X. I'm assigning, you know, if, if anyone had, um, Tepley for civil procedure, he always called it the bundle of sticks. You know, I'm assigning part of my bundle of sticks of ownership to someone else. Um, so it's not a work made for hire, it would be an assignment. Um, next is, is joint ownership. Um, joint ownership is tricky. You know, you're, you're kind of getting married with another author. Um, so each author has to create a substantial contribution to the work. Um, each author has to intend for their portion of the work to be merged with the remainder of the contributions. And each author must have contributed enough material to where that, that material contributed could be independently copyrighted. Um, the, the most common example here would be music and lyrics. So the, the melody of a song you know, could be independently copyrighted. The lyrics to a song could be independently copyrighted, but they're intended to be together. Um, the Copyright Act, you, you own an undivided interest in the entire work. Um, so, so it's one big melting pot. So, you know, if Patrick wrote the, mu the music, I wrote the lyrics, um, and they were intended to be joined, we would each own an undivided interest in the work. And let's just say he, you know, licensed off just the melody to be used and received royalties. I would get half of those. Similarly, if I wrote the lyrics and I licensed a right to use the lyrics, I would have to share those royalties with Patrick. So it, it is a odd arrangement and you're stuck with one another. Um, and you have to work with others for your other joint owners for the life of the copyright. Because if you want to issue an exclusive license, I would have to get consent from all of the other copyright owners. So if I wanted to grant an exclusive license to you know, the music and lyrics, I would have to get Patrick's okay about it. Real quick, um, are each of the authors uh, permitted to um, uh, contract otherwise, I agree otherwise, that one of them has the rights to the lyrics and one of the rights to the melody, or it's just set in stone that they're, they jointly own the two together and they're jointly the head. I had a situation recently where I had a, an artist and a, a woman who had written a children's book just written the text of the children's book. They couldn't come to agreement, and that's effectively what the, the agreement ended up being. Uh, I grant you a license to use my artwork. I'm retaining the artwork. You can sell the book. Uh, I don't get any royalties from the book. And you can do whatever you want with the book. I just want to do these A, B, C, D things with the artwork that I created for you. So yeah, you could agree by contract to different terms. Thank you. Yeah, which, which brings us, I think that's a perfect segue into implied licenses. Most people don't you know, really think about this when um, you know, photographs are taken, artwork is, is informally licensed. So oftentimes an implied license is created based upon the, the actions of the parties. So this is, you know, a situation where, you know, based upon the conduct of the parties, if, if the parties would have sat down, you know, taken time to memorialize a relationship, a, a license would have existed. Um, 
there, there is a little bit of a circuit split, so very jurisdictionally specific, you know, what elements need to be demonstrated, whether there is an implied license or not. Um, but, but the big picture is, is, you know, one, say I am a photographer and I take a picture and Patrick says, I would love to use that photograph on my website to promote my legal services. I say, sure, great, you know, um, how much will you pay me? Patrick says, $500. Great, wonderful. He puts it on his website. You know, we've just created an, an implied license by the act of the parties. Patrick puts it on his, on his website. The, the most important thing about here to know here is, is, you know, the license is only covered by the intended scope. If Patrick then, you know, uses that photograph and, you know, puts it in a nationwide ad campaign that runs during the Super Bowl, um, you know, that would not be covered by his implied license. And, you know, I could, say, hey, wait, you know, I, I only got $500 for this, you know, this is not within in the scope of what we understood. Um, you know, implied license cases are very, very fact-based, um, and it, it is, you know, a different test for each circuit to determine, you know, what that implied license, you know, whether it existed and, and the terms of it. So like I said, you know, lots of examples of, of copyrights, you know, they can be, you know, literary works, pictorial works, sculptures, architectural works, so, you know, buildings, uh, musical works, motion pictures, songs, plays, and, and sound recordings. Um, one item to note, you know, did not include specifics into it, but the copyright statute does have a specific carve out for architectural works, you know, while you can have copyright protection over them. There's exceptions that allow, you know, for example, in movies, you have the New York skyline um, that you, you can't be subject to a copyright infringement suit because you're using the New York skyline and one of those buildings is subject to copyright protection. So there are so, some exceptions um, that, are, that are unique in, in architectural works, which for extra reading, um, if you would like to go back and look at that, it is, it is pretty interesting. All right, why register a copyright? You know, like I said at the beginning, um, copyrights are created when the work is affixed. I put my brush to canvas and a, a copyright's created. Um, but you know, registration creates different tools to protect your copyright. Um, without a registration, the owner of the copyrighted material can't file a lawsuit to enforce their rights to protect their copyrighted work. Um, two, you know, registering a copyright, you know, puts the world on notice. You can search the copyright office database for, you know, who, who owns works. Um, and, you know, within a certain time frame, you know, there, there are some timelines to, to get additional rights and remedies. Um, so, so the big ones, you know, you can file a lawsuit. Two, you can seek statutory damages, and at the discretion of the court, you can receive attorney's fees. Um, it, it was an open question until 2019 about you know, whether or not you can file a lawsuit um, pre-registration uh, of a copyright. In 2019, the Supreme Court um, made this point clear that you, you know, needed to have a, a registration um, that that paper in your hand um, b before filing a complaint. If not, you know you're going to be subject to a motion to dismiss, and and your claim would be dismissed. Um, the fortunate thing is is that the copyright office, you know, most applications take about a month or two to process. Um, during COVID, the delay was significant, but in situations like these, for about eight hundred dollars, you can have an expedited. Um, special handling, and every attempt is made by the Copyright Office to have your registration within five business days. So if, if you're in a situation to where you, know, you need to enforce your rights, um, you can easily fill out a form online at the Copyright Office, request special, special handling, a king's ransom of about $800, but you will get your registration via, via email. Yes. So, for example, if the copyright itself was created 20 years ago, but it wasn't registered until this year, could you retroactively sue for infringement 
for the time that it wasn't actually registered, or does the infringing action have to be from the point of registration onward? Can we put a pin in that? We are going to we are going to discuss that. Um, so, what rights? You know, you, you have a copyright. You know, what rights do you have? Um, you have the right to reproduce it. Um, you have the right to prepare derivative works based upon it. You know, you have rights to distribute. You know, assign ownership. You have the right to license it. Um, you know, perform the works publicly. Um, display the works publicly and perform the works publicly. So, you know, those are your basic bundle of sticks and, you know, you can license or assign these as you see fit. So next, just to go briefly over, you know, the, the process. Um, first, I would like to say, you know, the U.S. Copyright Office has documents called circulars um, and they're three to five page explanatory instruction documents that, that are great walking, you know, attorneys and, and individuals filing pro se about, you know, how to select the right forms and, and file a copyright application. Um, so you can file online or in the mail. Um, you know, you provide the information about the work itself, the author, date of creation, um, depending upon the type of of work that you're attempting to register, um, some additional details, and then a non-refundable filing fee um, with the application. You know, right now, like I said, um, for electronically filed applications to where the Copyright Office does not have questions, um, with digital deposits, the majority of applications are digital deposits. For example, if I'm registering software, I can upload on the Copyright Office's site my deposit copy, i.e. the example that they, they keep. Um, about you know less than two months, um, ma mailing claims, if you want to do it, snail mail. The fee is more expensive, but you know four to five months. Um, the, the fees range from $35 to $95, um, depending upon the type of application that you are making to the Copyright Office. Um, the majority of applications are about $45, which is a single author, you know, one author has created a work. So, you know, really reasonable cost. Um, so I think it is a good bang for your buck. Um, next, copyrights aren't forever. Um, similar to, you know, patents and copyrights are items that, you know, do have a, a, a term certain, you know, trademarks can, can last forever. Um, but works created on or after January 1, 1978, life of the author plus 70 years, um, works made for hire and anonymous works 95 years from publication or 125 years from creation, whichever is less. So, you know, while, while it is a term certain, it is a long term certain. So hopefully, you know, my six year old creates a prolific drawing and I can get a significant amount of protection out of it. So that takes us to part two, um, introduction to copyright infringement, and I will pass it over to Patrick. Thank you. So on the topic of what is copyright infringement, it's, a, it's fairly simple but somewhat complicated. Uh, the simple part is an infringement occurs when somebody violates the exclusive rights of a copyright holder. Those are the exclusive rights that Erica was talking about earlier. Uh, you take somebody else's work and you copy it, distribute it, perform it, display it, or create a derivative work without permission. Those are all infringements of somebody's copyright. Uh, a derivative work, I don't think we touched on that. A derivative work um, is, is a work based on or derived from one or more pre-existing works. So by way of example, a movie that was based on a book, that would be a derivative work. Um, I, I, I give this example sometimes, that about once a year, I'll, I'll have somebody call me up and they'll say, hey, I really like this ad. How much of this do I need to change to not get in trouble so I can use it? I, I think they've just pretty much per se created a derivative work. Uh, but, but anyways, I pass that along. Uh, examples of copyright infringement. Uh, using copyrighted music or video without a license. An example would be something as simple as background music playing at a lobby 
or even if you call somebody up and they put you on hold and there's music playing while you're on hold, that could be a copyright infringement. And, and if you're engaged in activities like that, you may end up hearing from uh, BMI or ASCAP, which are music licensing entities. And uh, their goal in life is to get every bar, restaurant, uh, wedding venue, and any other business that might play music to sign a license. And they will just cold call these businesses and try to, uh, let's just be polite and say coerce, coerce them into a license. Um, motion picture, yes, sir. The infringement is that they're, they're using it for business purpose? If they were doing it personal, it would be a if it was per If it was completely personal, it's not an issue. Obviously, I can have Alexa playing music in my house all day long. Uh, but when I'm in a business setting and I'm doing it for the public as a, at large, it's not unlike a sports bar. If you have televisions playing sports, you've got to get a specific license to play sports on all the TVs in your sports bar. And if you do have a sports bar with a bunch of TVs, you're going to hear from the Motion Picture Licensing Corp, uh, who I'm actually dealing with now. Uh, they uh, are, are coming after a very, very large client of ours. And their theory is, listen, you have lots of locations. Somewhere in these lots of locations, you have to have TVs in like a break room, a gym, a conference room, somewhere that's playing CNN or something somewhere. And that's basically how they try to get their foot in the door and, again, try to politely threaten you into signing a license agreement. So in this particular case, my client actually has a tremendous amount of uh, homegrown content that they play on all these televisions. So I don't think we actually have a problem. Um, another example, reproducing written or graphic content without permission. An example of that would be if you print an online article to PDF and then you blast it out to your clients, that's a copyright infringement. You don't have permission to make that copy and to distribute it in that manner. If you want to uh, alert your clients to an article, send them a link. Uh, don't send the actual copy. And if you do send copies like that, this is what the Copyright Clearance Center is for. Uh, another entity that will chase after uh, large companies on the theory that somebody someplace in your organization must be making illicit copies of uh, articles or web pages or something, so you need a license. And the, the last example I have here is adapting artwork for commercial purposes without the artist's consent. And this is actually the thing that comes up most often. Uh, typically in the context of some marketing person finds a photograph online they really like and they copy, save, paste onto the website, onto social media, whatever. And then the artist who is, you know, out of curiosity or deliberately as a part of a pattern of conduct, uh, searching the internet for their photographs uh, will find this infringement and then send a demand letter. And you may get a demand letter from uh, somebody like AP Images or Getty Images, and I've had clients get uh, several of those, and they tend to ignore them, and the price keeps going up every time they ignore them. And then ultimately, uh, the complaint finds its way into the hands, typically of a law firm by the name of Higby and Associates, which is a somewhat notorious uh, copyright plaintiff's firm. Troll. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, did I say that? Yes, you said it out loud. Uh, we can edit that out later. Um, <laughs> And by then the price has gone up exponentially and you, you'll spend a lot of money uh, negotiating the price back down with them. So uh, that's something to take very seriously uh, and to really educate the clients as to what they should and should not be doing and putting on their websites and social media pages. If any of your clients own bars or restaurants, you know, Pandora, Spotify, you know, most streaming services do have a commercial option and it is more expensive on the front end, but BMI and ASCAP, you know, it, it used to be they would send you a sticker to put in the window of your bar. Um, they have BMI and ASCAP police um, that, that go to different, I've always wanted this job, <laughs> be perfect, like college kid job go around and you know check it out to see if bars and restaurants are in compliance. Uh, elements of a copyright infringement claim. Uh, the first is that a valid copyright exists. Uh, second, the defendant 
copied the work without authorization. Now, I want to point out the word copied because the copy, the word copied suggests that I actually saw your work and I affirmatively did something to copy your work. Compare that to trademarks and patents. Trademarks and patents do not have any room for coincidental similarities. Copyright law does. Two people could create something that, that is very similar, but coincidentally so, and there will be no liability. Patents and trademarks, if you've got two trademarks that are very, very similar and it's confusing the public, it doesn't matter if it was a pure coincidence. You're still liable for trademark infringement. The third factor is that the infringing work is substantially similar to the protected work. And again, compare it to the, the test in copyright law, which is uh, confusingly similar. The public is being confused by these similarities. In the copyright context, nobody needs to be confused. It just needs to be uh, a substantially similar work. So a, a prevailing plaintiff, is entitled to actual damages and any additional profits of the defendant that were not included within the actual damages. Uh, also, if the plaintiff timely filed their copyright application, as Erica explained, uh, the plaintiff could be entitled to statutory damages. Statutory damages typically range from $750 to $30,000 per infringed work. Uh, there is also uh, a heightened level of statutory damages for willful infringement, which is $150,000 per work, and a reduced amount for, let's just call them innocent infringers, for $200 per work. There's also a, a relatively recent, and I've only seen it once in litigation, uh, statutory damage that applies to a provision of the copyright, uh, or after the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it involves the removal of copyright management information. Now, copyright management information, uh, the obvious one would be the C in the circle and the name of the owner and the date, but it could also just include like a, uh, the photographer's name on a photograph or a watermark, or even uh, some courts are, are willing to entertain perhaps uh, the metadata on a digital photograph. Now, if you take that photograph and you remove the, the copyright management information and then distribute the photograph, not only are you uh, liable for trademark infringement, but now you're liable under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for statutory damages ranging from 2,500 to 25,000 per infringement, not per work, but per infringement. So if you took that same photograph and you put it on you know, three social media sites, you've now committed three infringements. And there's there's some uh, learning curve going on as to exactly how to calculate those damages. Um, there were some cases where uh, the plaintiff wanted to collect for every view that took place on YouTube. And the court said, no, we're not gonna do that. They uploaded it once, it was, was one violation. Uh, but there was another one where in, in Texas, where the defendant changed it, you know, to remove the, the, the copyright management information, and then email blasted it out to like 11,000 or so clients. And the court agreed with the plaintiff that each and every one of those was a violation and tagged them for $5,000 per violation, almost $39 million. So this is a real serious infringement and you, you, your clients should be aware of this sort of thing. Never, never, never remove the copyright notice of somebody's work. Um, and then to answer the specific question about damages, so on this slide, so timely filing, um, you, you have a three month period from the, the publication date. So, you know, when it is, publicly available, which that's highly, you know, highly technical and, and highly, you know, lit litigated, you know, when that publication date was, but, you know, you have three months. And if, if you register within that three month period, 
your registration relates back to that date of publication. You also have, you know, we don't have time to go into it today. You know, there are, there are pre-registration options um, that, that you have before publication as well. Um, but, but it's a three month period, you know, a, a window you know, grace period um, to, to register your work. And it makes it much easier for, you know, post publication to, you know, get actual damages, like Patrick said, or, you know, stat, you know statutory damages. Um, with, without that registration, I don't believe you can look back and, and collect, collect damages. You only can collect damages for you know that infringement post registration. The, the statutory and uh, statutory damages and attorneys. Correct. Yeah, I, I will note that the, the DMCA statutory damages actually do not require that prior registration. Those could be assessed regardless of whether the violations commence before registration. Some copyright infringement defenses, uh, obviously, no substantial similarity. Um, proof of independent creation. Uh, I mean, the proof of independent creation, that goes back to what I was uh, e explaining earlier, how two works could be substantially similar, but if I created mine independently, I'm not going to be allowed for copyright infringement. Uh, just um, by way of example, if, if I ask everybody in the room to write down the rules of baseball, they're relatively simple rules, and I imagine that our narratives would be substantially similar to each other. But since nobody presumably looked over each other's shoulder and copied, there's not going to be any liability. There's not going to be any copyright infringements. Uh, the statute of limitations, it's uh, three years from the date the copyright holder discovered or with due diligence should have discovered the infringement. So to your question about the 20 years, if it was going on for 20 years, I probably should have known about it, and perhaps the statute of limitations has run on that. Uh, there's, there's two more uh, that we're gonna discuss with different slides here. We've got fair use and public domain. Public domain, um, I, I used to use my, my teenage son as the example on this, but I've actually heard Go ahead. Sorry, so if the statute of limitations yeah. has passed, does that turn it into kind of like an implied license? I don't know that I would say there's any license. I think that it's just they have the right to do it. I mean, okay. a license would imply that you're, you have at least some contractual control over their use and there's some parameters drawn around their use. But if they've been doing it and you, you've blown your opportunity to complain about it, I, I, think it, I think it's a waiver. I think they, they can do whatever they want with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so they public domain. So like I said, I, I used to uh, use my teenage son as the example here, but I've actually heard grown adults say this, and I, so I have to state, the internet is not the public domain. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, it's shocking. So I, I, I genuinely had people say to me, well, I, I got that off the internet. That's a public domain, right? I can, I can use it. Mm, no. It doesn't work like that. The public domain is actually a very narrow subset of, of works that exist. You got works that are not copyrightable, which is, you know, ideas themselves are not copyrightable. Uh, processes, systems, titles, short phrases and slogans and some other types of things are not inherently protectable under copyright law. Then you have works that have been, have been assigned to the public domain doesn't happen a lot, but you see it now and again. Some author, some prolific author might decide, you know what, I want everybody to have access to my works. I'm you know, on death's door or whatever, so I relinquish my copyright and the public now has free access to my works. Uh, and then the final one is uh, works for which copyrights have expired. But as Erica indicated, copyright protection is really long. So if you're finding it on the internet, it is probably owned by somebody and protected by copyright law, and you should probably not just willy-nilly use it. One note there, I mean, I think the Bible is the classic example. However, you have to be careful um, because certain translations of the Bible still may be subject to copyright. And um, I'll just add something from our medical legal dinner that I was mentioning earlier. Um, so there are 
news publications in the state of Nebraska and around the country know that they don't have copyright on what they do. So Nebraska Examiner, a Flatwater Free Press, they their articles are for anybody free to use. You see them in the Daily Record. It, it's a, it's a nonprofit uh, newspaper outlet, and so they actually give up their copyright, and they have nonprofit status because of that. Yeah. In the college textbook campus, open text is becoming very, very popular to try to to break up the the cartel of, of textbook companies. You know, certain professors have written textbooks similarly and said, "Hey, you know, here here is a textbook that everyone can reference um, free of charge." So, one thing I mentioned was that uh, copyright law does not protect ideas. Um, and the thing a lot of people like to say about it is it doesn't protect ideas, it, it protects the expression of ideas. So I might have an idea for a movie where uh, two cops with completely different personalities are forced to be partners and then they discover a plot and then they uh, get, come together and, and fight crime and solve the case and come to respect each other by the end of the day, you know. Well, that's a great idea, but I don't own that idea. I don't own it until it becomes, you know, uh, bad boys, you know, or or rush hour. Or rush hour, yeah, exactly. Turner and Hooch is that? A, no, it's a dog. <laughs> it's a, that's not a good example. But anyways, you get the idea. I mean, I can come up with ideas all day, but until I turn them into something, a script, uh, or even just you know an outline, I, I don't really have anything. And even if I have an outline, I don't necessarily own that idea still. I just own what I put down on paper as the outline. So that's what I mean by you don't own ideas under copyright law. Clients don't understand that a lot. I have <laughs> many calls. I have an idea I'd like to copyright. No, you no. don't. <laughs> uh, so fair use. Fair use is uh, another fairly misunderstood area of the law. The Copyright Act provides that the fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. Now, those things that are listed there are not being given, you know, free reign to do whatever they want because it still has to be fair use. So the act sets out a four-part balancing test. Uh, and all four of these factors need to be taken together. Uh, no one factor outweighs the other. Um, the first is the purpose and character of the use. Now, as hinted by the prior slide, nonprofit educational uses are favored over commercial uses. Um, transformative uses are preferred over direct copying. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work Courts tend to give greater protection to creative work, so fair use will often apply more broadly to nonfiction, you know, a, a, just a dry historical account of things that have happened or something of that nature. You're more likely to be able to take chunks of that work because they're just stating historical facts that have happened. Uh, the amount and substantiality of the portion used, obviously the more you use, the less likely it is to be fair use. But even a small amount could be too much if it takes the heart of the work. So if somebody has a, a book that has become known for you know, a certain passage or a movie has a super climactic moment and you're trying to, to use that you know, on, say, your Facebook feed to promote your business, you're trying to turn it into a meme or something, well, you, you may be more likely to be called to the carpet for that sort of use than if you took some, you know, less important scene of a movie. Uh, the fourth factor is the effect upon the potential market or the value of the copyrighted work. So by way of example, uh, if I were to show a movie clip in a classroom as a prompt for a classroom discussion, say it's a 15 minute clip or something, that, that's probably fair use. Uh, but if I show the entire movie to the class, then yeah, it's probably not fair use. And I'll just give you an example. In this uh, January of 2020, uh, there was an elementary school that held a PTA fundraiser and they did a showing of The Lion King. Well, Disney's little stormtroopers who uh, monitor everything, 
uh, found out about it. And next thing you know, the school was getting a demand for a $250 license fee for the movie that they showed. So not everything is, is, is fair use. And like I said, I have a lot of clients who think fair use is super, super broad. It's actually not. And it's a defense. It's I, a defense, I, I, yes. I think that's oftentimes over overlooked that it's not a, oh, well, an exception to, to copyright infringement. It, it's a defense. So you have to get sued first, and then it is an affirmative defense that you could make to excuse yourself right. from liability. Right. And those are the conversations I have with clients when they say, well, can I do this? Isn't it fair use? So it's parody. Well, this is, that's all great. And, and when they sue you, you can argue that you can pay tens of thousands of dollars to try and advance that claim. But yeah, then you're spending money. Do you really want to do this or just go find something completely different, you know, invent something yourself or you create something yourself? Uh, I don't have a, a slide for this last one because in all candor, I, I, I thought of it this morning. Um, but I wanted you guys to be aware of uh, the Copyright Claims Board, which is a recently created, uh, let's just call it, agency of the Copyright Office. I mean, what it, what it does is it handles copyright small claims, um, claims up to $30,000. There's a very small uh, filing fee of $100. I will say uh, it's somewhat voluntary between the parties insofar as uh, I can bring a claim against you, but you have 60 days to opt out and say, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to do that there. Uh, but if, if the parties want to do it there, uh, there is a, a three person panel. They'll look at the claim. They'll render a judgment. Uh, if you don't like it, you can appeal the judgment to a district court. Otherwise, it's a binding judgment against you. And the, uh, the plaintiff, if they lose, cannot go turn around and then bring that claim later somewhere else. Is that a modified rules of uh, evidence and procedure sort of thing? Yeah, it's all, it's ha yeah, it's ha yeah, it's, 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 it's all handled online. Uh, very limited discovery processes. If there's any hearings, they're, they're handled by uh, teleconferences. So yeah, it's a very streamlined proceeding, uh, which you know, you're paying hundred bucks. You get what you pay for. Can you still be represented by an attorney, or is it you have to be? Um, you you can, but you don't have to be. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you want any more information about that, you can find it at ccb.gov. So then part three takes us to current and notable copyright infringement cases and AI developments. The fun part. Um, so some recent notable copyright cases, um, you know, Ed Sheeran was, was recently, but also the, the Blurred Lines case, um, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams um, against the estate of Marvin Gaye. I, I, I will have to look at my notes about the, the facts of this case because they're, they're so interesting. Um, long story short, um, Robin Thicke and Pharrell had a song, Blurred Lines. I'm sure all of you have heard it. Um, it earned them over $16 million in sales, but there was a, a threat from Marvin Gaye's estate, reminder from the beginning of the presentation, you know, even though Marvin Gaye has since passed away, you know, the, the copyright survived, um, sur survived and the estate was responsible for enforcing rights. Um, the, the family of Marvin Gaye thought that the blurred lines song and melody, um, infringed upon the copyright to gotta give it up. Um, Robin Thicke and Pharrell, in, in an attempt to resolve this, actually filed a declaratory judgment suit saying, hey, I want you court to, to determine that you know, our song does not, not infringe. Counterclaim ensued and Robin Thicke and Pharrell were, were unsuccessful in their declaratory judgment and the estate of, of, of Marvin Gaye um, prevailed and, and found that Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams were, were liable for copyright infringement. Um, the, the holding was, you know, the song's similarity to Marvin Gaye's work was too substantial, but, but the interesting and controversial part was, is, you know, there was no direct copying. Um, I would like to know Robin Thicke's defense was amazing here. Um, you know, he was listed as an author of, of the work. Going back to the part one, Pharrell and Robin Thicke were, were joint 
own joint creators of the work. Um, but, but Robin Thicke claimed that he was so high on Vicodin and alcohol during the writing process that he couldn't have contributed, therefore couldn't have infringed. He said this in a deposition. It is on video. I, you can find it on YouTube. Um, but that defense was unsuccessful. <laughs> he was listed as an author. Um, and they, they paid $5 million in damages to the Marvin Gaye estate. Um, so if you're, if you're going to assert that defense for your clients, I do not recommend it. Um, next, um, the, the Andy Warhol case. Um, th this is one, you know, it, it really has been positioned as a copyright case. I view it as a, a, a breach of contract license case. Um, so in May of 2023, you know, the, the Supreme Court ruled against Andy Warhol's estate um, for copyright infringement related to, to you know, Prince's use of, of a, a photograph in one of his um, pieces of artwork. But, but what happened here was, is there was a photographer, you know, her, her last name was Goldsmith. Um, she was hired to take photographs of prints in 1981. In 1984, Vanity Fair hired Andy Warhol to, to create an illustration of prints and Vanity Fair paid Goldsmith $400 so Andy Warhol could use a photograph taken by Goldsmith um, as a reference point. Um, and that, that's notable, you know, as, as a reference point. Um, so after Prince's death, Condé Nast, who owns Vanity Fair, used Warhol's art created, again, as a reference point for that art created, um, Goldsmith's photograph, for a tribute publication. So, you know, very widely distributed um, as, as a magazine cover. Um, Goldsmith said, wait, 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 you know, I was paid $400 to have, you know, my photograph used as a reference point for Andy Warhol's work. Um, you know, the license was to use, you know, that reference photograph once, um, you know, not, oh, it's going to be, you know, as a reference point for an Andy Warhol artwork that is, you know, widely distributed throughout the country on, on magazines. Um, after Warhol altered the image, um, you know, it was a question of, you know, did it belong to Warhol or, you know, did, did Goldsmith, the photographer, retain some degree of control, you know, since she was the individual that created the reference image? Um, you know, the, the Supreme Court found that, you know, Goldsmith did retain some rights and Andy Warhol's use was, you know, one, not fair use, and, and two, you know, what it turned on was is Warhol's use was commercial in nature. You know, it was commercial in nature because it was, you know, published as, as a tribute in a Condé Nast magazine, which subscribers purchased. Um, I view it as a licensing rights case and not so much a copyright case, but, you know, fair use defense was definitely triggered there and unsuccessful. So we wanted to talk about uh, some AI developments because there's been a lot of uh, chatter online and, and some things in the news. Uh, in, in just recent months, uh, we've got Sarah Silverman suing OpenAI, which is uh, the company behind ChatGPT, Getty Images suing a tool called Stable Diffusion. The New York Times has blocked OpenAI's web crawler uh, and is also considering litigation. And uh, a group of artists have filed a class action lawsuit as well. Uh, the complaints here are, are twofold. Uh, one is that AI is going out to the internet and copying an enormous amount of copyrighted content. And they're taking this content and storing it and using it to basically educate its AI and make the AI smarter and, and more efficient. Um, but they're doing all of this without anybody's permission. So the, the argument is, hey, you've copied my work and we don't feel that that is fair use. Uh, the second complaint is that the work product that comes out the back end of the AI um, is either substantially similar in some cases, and there have been cases where the work product, you'll see like 
Shutterstock's logo all scrambled up, and it's clear that the image was a Shutterstock logo, and it's just the end product being spit out of ChatGPT is is, is re reflective of the fact that this is still a uh, an image that's a derivative work on somebody else's photograph. So those are the the main complaints that uh, you're creating derivative works with with my work without my permission. You're using my work, copying my work for a purpose that wasn't authorized. And so it'll be interesting to see how all these lawsuits play out in the, in the, in the coming years here. Um, the next slide I thought was really interesting. This image was created by a computer system called Creativity Machine. It's owned by uh, the, the Creativity Machine is owned by an individual named Stephen Thaler. So Mr. Thaler submitted an application to the Copyright Office to try to register this image. And in his application, he stated clearly that uh, the image was autonomously created by a computer algorithm running on a machine. And he said that it was a work for hire to the owner of Creativity Machine, which was him. So he was trying to be the copyright claimant for something created by AI that he felt was a work for hire to his benefit. The Copyright Office refused registration because the work lacked the human authorship necessary to support a copyright claim. And he appealed that, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, that? No. So he appealed that within the Copyright Office, uh, submitted requests for reconsideration, they were denied. He went to uh, federal court and the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia agreed with the Copyright Office and dismissed his case on summary judgment. So this is important for a variety of reasons and for us as lawyers important because imagine the situation where you've got a, a client who is engaging in a contract. They want to enter into a contract with somebody who's going to create some sort of IP for them. Is it software? It could be an ad campaign. It could be anything that might be protectable under copyright law. And, and your client may think, I'm paying them $5,000. The contract says they're going to sign it to me, and I'm going to own it, and I can prevent others from using it because I'm now the owner of it. And then you find out, oh, no, I, I used Chet GPT to make that. Yeah, there's no copyright on that. You don't own that. And then, what, the world is apparently free to use this work product that the client paid for. So consider whether in the context of service agreements or even uh, M&A deals, whether or not you should be using uh, reps and warranties that expressly state that any IP was not created by AI. Is there a question? So what if an artist took this AI-created artwork as a reference point and made it in paint version. Could they then copyright that? <laughs> but then I guess part two of that question, if AI is scraping the internet for photos that are copyrighted, is there a risk that there could be a derivative infringement claim, you think? Oh, I think there is definitely a risk that what is spit out of the back end of AI could infringe on somebody else's rights. And the slide that, oh, there's the next slide. This next slide is interesting to that point. This is uh, an email I received within the last two weeks uh, from a company named Checkmark Network. And what they're selling is a subscription where they will use AI to go scour the internet and find infringing uses of your client's works. So I think we're at a, at a point here where we have AI taking works, creating new works, and other AI checking that work to see how similar it is to perhaps the original work. <laughs> and, and you have an even scarier, so on the registration piece, you can, it's called a limitation of claim. So you, know, you can say, I'm only claiming copyright protection in you know, the, the painting part of it, and not you know, the, the AI generate, generated piece, which you know, as, as we discussed, isn't subject to copyright. But two, you know, my, my clients are very, very nervous because in the marketing context, you know, lots of ad agencies are now saying like, oh, well, we can do an AI generated ad campaign. It's gonna save you a lot of money and not having to you know, arrange shoots, 
not having to deal with, you know, in, in specific jurisdictions, union rights. But, you know, a, as lawyers are saying, wait, 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 you know, time out. You know, previously we were worried about one potential, you know, copyright claim. You know, we're, we're not sufficiently making a transformative work from, you know, one individual, you know, founded on the internet. But now with, with you know, chat GPT or, or the competitors, you know, you could be looking at, you know, who knows how many um, potential claimants that, you know, you're collating to this new, you know, like, like this picture, you know, who knows how many sources this, this pulled from and, and theoretically, you know, 40, 50, you know, who knows how many potential claims for infringement you could, you could be subject to with, you know, these type of, of AI scrapers finding, oh, well, you took a piece of, you know, my copyright protect, copyright protected artwork. So one question back on the picture. So was there actually text direction on how to make this picture that was done by a human, done by Stephen Thaler or somebody that used Stephen Thaler's, obviously, like somebody gave it direction or did it just say? Well, presume, I, I will candidly tell you, I can't answer that exact question. I Presumably he did give it some sort of direction. And then as a result of that direction, that is what, what happened. Um, but which the copyrightability you know, of the, the prompt itself, I think, is a whole separate. Yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can really say because I said, you know, give me a picture of a, you know, whatever that may be, a, you know, a garden. Uh, I don't think he could possibly claim copyright in the end result because of that. I think it's still all he did was point it in the right direction, and the actual work was created uh, by the 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 AI itself. So that concludes the copyright portion. I, I know in the agenda, there was a reference to the Jack Daniels VIP products case, the bad spaniels. Um, but it's still a very, very interesting case. So we've added it as a bonus slide, but you know, maybe we handle, I know we're over technically over time. Maybe we handle copyright questions first. And then I think we're glad to, Okay, well, we have three minutes for questions. <laughs> That's um, a fun case. It is a fun case. We can talk about we can talk about bad spaniels. <laughs> so, uh, bad spaniels. There's a company called VIP Products. VIP Products makes squeaky dog toys, and they made a squeaky dog toy shaped like a Jack Daniels bottle. And instead of Jack Daniels, it says bad spaniels. Instead of old number seven brand Tennessee sour mash whiskey, it says the old number two on your Tennessee carpet. Um, they thought it was funny. Some people think it's funny. Um, so Jack Daniels sued them for trademark infringement and dilution. BIP products argued that the toy is an expressive work protected by the First Amendment and a parody falling within fair use. Now this went up to the Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit agreed with them. Went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, nah. But the Supreme Court's reason was really keyed on the fact that the branding of this was Bad Spaniels. So the fact that Bad Spaniels was being used as a source identifying trademark was the deciding factor for the court in this instance. Uh, they did note that because it was a parody with, to the issue of trademark infringement, that may have that may have an impact. I mean, there may be consumers who look at that and understand, oh, that's not Jack Daniels. That's Jack Daniels would not possibly make this toy, you know, and talk about poop. So uh, they acknowledge that it could be a factor, but they they ruled that this does not give you uh, does not get you off the hook. You still got to go to trial on the issue of likelihood of confusion and dilution. That's the bonus case. That's the bonus case. Sorry and thank you. <laughs> oh, no, we always get excited. They're like, oh, there's an IP-related case at the Supreme Court. And if you want to listen to the audio opinion of Kagan delivering the opinion, it is fabulous. She actually does recite part of Aqua's Barbie Girl song in the opinion. So IP cases are cool and hip at the Supreme Court. So questions? Okay, so on um, social media, let's say Instagram, for example, I want to create a new 
uh, video and I can very easily find a song and put it in there, but I can also um, retitle that audio clip in Instagram to say that it's like my own personal because I add like half a second of me talking or something like that. I can essentially make it look on there like it's, it's original audio to me. Um, I think sometimes you don't even have to change the audio and it will just rename it to you. That seems wildly unfair to the original artists and nobody's calling out all these people that are using that. I mean, I mean social media is the wild west right now. Yeah, so it, it's funny you say that. I, I represent a number of, of commercial clients who engage influencers. Um, the FTC just released new guidelines on influencers. Um, so um, that, that, that's a notable development. And I think the FTC just in marketing claims are, are going to come after influencers much more heavily um, a, as we move you know, into 2023, 2024. Um, but you know, Instagram, TikTok, social media, um, one, going back to Pat, Patrick's point, I mean, they are likely infringements. You know, you're saying, oh, I'm changing it a little, but you know, you're still likely infringing on that copyright. However, you know, TikTok, Instagram, a, a lot of these platforms do have, you know, voiceovers and music that are a part of, you know, there, there's different terms of each of them, but you know, basically, you know, rights buy out, you know, libraries to where you know, as on that platform, you know, you can you can use them. Instagram or TikTok has you know purchased the rights for for sharing on those platforms. But you know, it, especially if you're a large corporation, um, you you have to be very very care careful. You know, BMI, ASCAP, um, you know, the the creators of that music will will likely you know co come after you, especially if you're selling your product. You know, using your you know, using that, that social media platform to, to promote your product. It, it should be like an add-on, right? So inside your creator studio of your social media account that you can then make sure that it's all, um, all the rights are, you're paying for all the rights. Correct. Yeah, it is not that intuitive right now, you know, and I know some like BMI, ASCAP, you know, they, they do have some, you know, add on licenses for that, but it's not, you know, kind of a singular suite right now. You know, if I'm on YouTube and I try to post something, they will take it down yes. within 30 seconds. Um, they're very good on YouTube to take it down, but it doesn't seem like that on Instagram. Mm -hmm. This is why I haven't gotten my influencing career off the ground yet. I have too much fear about the IP ramifications, among other things, but. So when you were talking about processes that are not copyrightable, what does that mean? Like, I have a case right now where we're dealing with something, something similar to a client wants to register a like a, a test that's I, akin to the Enneagram test. Is that something that they can copyright or is that like a process that's not copyrightable? Well, if you have a, well, it, there are certain business processes that, that could be patentable. Um, and a process itself, if, if, you, if you have a process, you know, It'd be kind of like trying to, to own a 10-step program, really. I mean, you can write about it and write how, about how great it is, important it is, and this is what you should do to get your life back on track. But do you really own this 10-step program? I mean, can you prevent other people from talking about it or promoting it or doing it? Um, and so I think that's what we're talking about. We say you can't really own under copyright law a process. There can be certain processes that could be patentable, but yeah, under trademark law, about the best you can do is whatever you want to write about it, video, blog about it, or whatever about it, you can own that. And, and the branding of the name. And the branding of the name. Well, in some things, you know, depends on what the process is. If it's a backroom process on how to conduct business or something, uh, perhaps you don't want to tell anybody. You just keep that a trade secret. 
you know, so it depends. I mean, like I said, you have to have a conversation with the client about, well, what are you trying to do with this? What do you, who do you want to sell it to? You know, that sort of thing to understand where the value lies. And sometimes the value lies in keeping it secret. And to piggyback off of that, is it sometimes advisable to just say, you know, put all rights reserved? And guess what? You may not have any rights to this, but you're scaring away people from, from maybe using it for a little bit, right? Right. Oh, there's an absolute chilling chilling effect with you know the use of you know both in, in trademarks, copyrights, you know patent pending. You know there there is to the you know uns, unsophisticated person who's who's approaching you know your your work at a chilling effect of oh you know maybe I think twice, but unless it's on the internet um, to 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 you know copy or use it. 